Congress uh, woman, my name is Gabriel, and I have a question concerning Gabriel, Sudan specifically. Gabriel, beautiful name. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> should the situation in Sudan take a turn for the worse, what would you personally think is the most appropriate immediate reaction? From very the good, very good. Now, there are a lot of trouble from spots in the world. Uh, a lot of uh, good things happening, a lot of terrible things happening. So I don't know whether you really meant Sudan for real, or whether you meant whether you meant Egypt or, or Tunisia or, or Yemen or lots of other places. Now in Sudan, uh, interesting things have been happening these past years. First, we had this horrible genocide in Darfur, and I, I was there in uh, in Darfur. It's a terrible situation, but it got so bad. You know, the Jamuwi they they would come here, and they would rape and, and mutilate people at, at, at night, women would be marked for life because you can't, uh, you can't touch a, a woman who's been violated that way and uh, they would be sent out every night to go get uh, wood or, or water for their family and it was just a terrible situation. And uh, the leader of Sudan, uh, such a horrible man, would take a, a military plane, paint it with white, which is the, the color of the UN planes, uh, put a professional looking insignia saying UN so people would see, oh my gosh, they're going to drop food, they're going to drop water, and then he would drop bombs. He would kill his own people. This man is, is cruel and deranged. So they just had an election, uh, North Sudan and South Sudan. And I don't know whether the elections were free and fair and, and it could, could it be that 95% of the people vote in an election? I don't know. I don't think so. But anyway, it is what it is. Um, so they're going to break away from each other. There's going to be two countries. So Sudan is going to be two countries. And uh, we hope that good things will happen. It's a horrible situation. I don't know what good will happen. But at least if the killing stop, you know, when things are so horrible that if you say, well, at least if the killing stops, that's an improvement. It is. So hold on a sec. That was good. So Sudan is a fixer-upper of the place. It's got a lot of potential. The Obama administration said, we will lift sanctions on Sudan if they were to have a free, fair election. Well, they had an election. I don't know whether over 90% of the people really vote. Uh, these folks, these poor folks are, are barely surviving. They certainly can't read. You know, they don't have a ballot where you have names. They have photos and, and they have colors. And, uh, and some of them are forced to vote. And um, So what are we going to do now? The promise was we would lift sanctions, so we're going to lift sanctions. Uh, I don't think it's time to lift sanctions, but anyway, that's where we are in Sudan. Now, what happened in Egypt, good things can come of that uh, if the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't take hold. Uh, as you know, uh, because you've heard all the news, Mubarak set up this false choice. He said, look, it's either me or this extremist group, the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, that's not really true. There are a lot of moderate voices in Egypt. If you've been to Egypt, uh, uh, or if you read about Egypt, you know that uh, how advanced that country is, and, and uh, people have been uh, eager to have, uh, have freedom and human rights, and a real election. They don't even have political parties. They have, Mubarak has set up sham parties. And so then he has an election that's sort of like a Sudanese <coughs> election. Lots of people vote and he gets elected, but they're not real elections. So there's a lot of opportunity now, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, optimism uh, that can only happen in, in a semi-free society. We know that we criticize Mubarak a lot, but some people say, hey, why don't we have that kind of change in Cuba? Uh, you can't, as much as we criticize Mubarak for being an imperfect leader, and he is, he is, uh, and he ruled with an authoritarian hand, and we're not, we're not forgiving him any of that. There's no way you can compare Mubarak with the Castro thug. And there's no way that, no way that you can compare uh, the rights that the Egyptian people have with the no rights that people have in Cuba. So the Cuba model is more like North Korea. Cuba would aspire one day to be like Egypt, where they do have Twitter and Facebook and they have computers. You know, we don't have any of that any of that in Cuba. So, um, <clears throat> so this, these past two weeks, a lot of my colleagues have asked me, well, you know, then uh, if it happens in Egypt, then it can happen in Cuba. We hope that it can, but remember that all of that spark that, that was in, in Egypt has not, there's no infrastructure for that 
to happen in, in, in Cuba, but we, we hope that one day it will. So that's a rambling Sudan, Egypt, Middle East kind of thing. Yes, sir. It was you and then you. Thank you. Hello, Congresswoman. My name is Andres. Andres, thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the, what many people are calling the Jasmine Revolution, which actually goes in place in Egypt. Um, note that many key U.S. allies in the, in the region are starting to deal with these protests. Egypt being the, fir Emma, Egypt being the first, and now Bahrain, they're having some white protests. Know. Or, you know, the seventh, the seventh fleet um, of the Navy is based yes. there. And they're key U.S. allies in kind of re repulsing um, uh, Iran, Iranian influence in the region. Yes. As well as in Jordan, and, in, um, uh, and now people are starting to look at Saudi Arabia, and the way in which that's going to affect foreign policy as well as Al Jazeera's, you know, role in all of it. Wow. <laughs> that will talk to a Valencian. This is unbelievable. That's a very good question. That's a wonderful, uh, wonderful statement. And what he points out is the dilemma that we find ourselves in. Because as much as we criticize Mubarak, and as much as, I mean, so what's happened in Egypt, what's happening in Bahrain, what's happening in Jordan, they are key U.S. allies. And without their help, uh, who knows who could be in government there. And that, that person or that party and that leader could be anti-U.S. and could say, you know, no, no military overflights over our country. No, uh, no, no ships stationed uh, um, around our, our area. They're all military out. So it's a problem. It's a problem. That's why, as imperfect a leader as Mubarak is, and I can say, I, I just I don't want to have you think that I'm justifying him, but because of Mubarak, we have had peace in that area of, of the world. And Israel has been very glad that Mubarak has been in power. Israel's very nervous now about what could happen. So we hope and we pray and we are working toward leaders in Egypt, and that's Egypt's decision, this decisions, but who will who will respect the rule of law, who will honor democracy, who will respect human rights, who will have true political reforms. And uh, that's what we want in Jordan, that's what we want in Bahrain, but it's very dicey right now because uh, you know how <coughs> beating your chest and saying nationalism and it's our country and uh, Yankees out, uh, that's very popular. And, and all of those countries with all of this wonderful jasmine revolution, or if it's a cedar revolution, or whatever revolution it is, it looks like it's going to ha have great promise, but it's also fraught with great danger, because it could easily go against the U.S. If these extremist elements tap into that popular sentiment that is anti-U.S., then we will, uh, we will be having a situation where these Leaders who are pro-U.S., in spite of having very restless populations against us, uh, will, will be toppled and they will be replaced by anti-U.S. leaders. So, you guys are living through a very interesting time right now of a realignment of the broader Middle East. And it will shape, shape the world for generations to come. And, uh, and we'll soon see whether the leaders who take root there, uh, the new generation, whether they will lead the country in the right direction for their people, which is for freedom, democracy, respect for human rights, the rule of law, and, and openness, transparency, and accountability, or whether they will be totalitarian, authoritarian regimes, uh, practicing Sharia law, where a person like me uh, would be beheaded <laughs> if I were to have any kind of uh, leadership position. So um, it could go either way. These years are going to be the most interesting years, uh, and you guys are, are living living through it. So we hope and pray and we work towards uh, that positive change, uh, not just for the people of those countries, but also because of our strong ally, Israel, and, uh, and because the relationship that we have with this country matters a lot for our national security, for our guys and gals in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and wherever they're stationed. And, uh, and I hope some of you consider a future in, uh, in the Foreign Service. It is a great, uh, it is a great career, and uh, you know, Georgetown right here, we have uh, wonderful schools here, and, uh, and I hope that you guys consider interning with us 
and uh, and also uh, coming to school up here because this is a great college town. Uh, I don't know how we get to the college town from Bahrain, but anyway, who's telling me?